The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome everyone. This is part of the Environmental Matters webinar series. And we're here to um, learn more about wetlands in the City of Superior and their importance. Our speaker today is Darian McNamara, and she is the Environmental Regulatory Coordinator for the City of Superior. She administers the city's wetland permitting program, along with environmental permitting and compliance for the city's landfill and other public works projects. Uh, and she's here to talk about wetlands. So I'll pass it to you, Darian. All right, thanks, Wendy. And I appreciate your interest in this topic. Um, I'm going to talk about wetlands in our community, specifically in Superior. But a lot of the information in this talk applies to wetlands throughout this region. And I'll also spend some time talking about a unique program that we have in Superior for balancing wetland conservation and development. So first of all, why talk about wetlands in Superior? Well, we're kind of unique here in that a huge proportion of land in the city is wetlands shown in here in blue on the slide. I'm going to take a minute to talk about why that is. If you think about our landscape, we're sandwiched between two large bodies of water, the St. Louis River and Lake Superior. And in between, here we sit a low-lying, flat piece of ground with two, um, two bodies of water around us and clay soils that don't drain very well. So it sets the stage for being a pretty soggy landscape. So consequently, we have lots of water in the city and lots of wetlands. And in fact, of all the undeveloped land in our city, 86% of it is wetlands, which is pretty remarkable. Now, you might ask yourself at this point why anyone thought this was ever a good place to develop in the first place. Um, and it turns out the same things that make this a good place for wetlands make it a good place for a port city. We're right up against large bodies of water, like I mentioned, and then being flat and about the same elevation as the water, it's a really good place for rail. And then now, of course, the highway system also, and for ships. So actually, we're kind of a better situated location for a port than Duluth, um, but also a great place for wetlands. So how do we continue to grow as a city, but also protect all the wetlands that we have? Well, I'll talk about how we're trying to do that. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit more about wetlands in general. So what is a wetland? Well, here's how the state defines a wetland. An area where water is at, near, or above the land surface, long enough to be capable of supporting aquatic or hydrophytic, basically water-loving vegetation, and which has soils indicative of wet conditions. And as it turns out, you don't have to have water at the surface for very long to create those wet conditions that they talk about in that definition. And while some wetlands that we think about, if you think of the, the ponds with ducks and maybe cattails, things like that, of course those have standing water year-round. Other wetlands only hold water for a few weeks in the spring, and then they dry up by July, and they're dry the rest of the year. So that can make it tricky for the layperson to identify exactly whether something is a wetland or not. But it also gives us a really rich diversity of different types of wetlands. And here on the slide you can see some examples of different wetlands we have uh, a big coastal estuary up on the top right. There's that wetland I described that everyone kind of classically thinks of with the cattails and the open water. And then the bottom right, we have a, a forested wetland. We also have um, a lot of alder swamp in Superior, alder thickets, alder brush, people call it different things. Um, basically, shrubby wetlands. And this makes great habitat for birds and for all sorts of different wildlife. This is another common type of wetland in this area called a sedge meadow. Sedges are basically like grasses. And so these wetlands kind of look like an, an open meadow. They're called wet meadows or wet prairies sometimes, and they, they do look just like that. In forested wetlands, you'll see different kinds of ferns and flowers and, again, more sedges in the understory and sometimes black ash or black spruce, green ash, sometimes aspen in the canopy. And then this is a really common looking wetland for Superior. We have aspen in the canopy, alder brush that I talked about in the shrub layer, and then different kinds of grasses and plants in the understory, some native, some not. So now I'm going to talk about some of the natural functions of a wetland. And the first is plant habitat. And not just any plant habitat, but going back to that definition, habitat for aquatic 
for hydrophytic, those water-loving plants. They're especially adapted for growing in soggy places where most plants can't survive. And if you look close, you'll see some of those adaptations. For example, some plants have spongy stems that are full of air pockets, and that helps the plants with cellular respiration, basically with breathing. Others have a waxy coating on their leaves to keep the water from soaking in. And some keep their roots right at the surface of the soil so that they stay above the water table, even when that water table is really close to the surface. Here in Superior, there are actually quite a few rare and threatened plants that only grow in wetlands. But because we have so many wetlands in our city, they're actually common here, although they're hard to find anywhere else. And wetland plants are not just neat to learn about and pretty to look at. They're also a very important source of nutrition for animals like ducks, fish, and other wildlife. Animals have also adapted to life in wetlands, using specific wetland plants for shelter, making nests, laying their eggs, and hiding from predators. And did you know that actually half of all the bird species in Wisconsin either feed or nest in wetlands? Pretty interesting. Another important function of wetlands is wildlife habitat. So not only birds are using the wetlands, actually 90% of our recreational fish species in the state depend on wetlands for part of their life cycle. The shallow water and the wetland plants make great shelter for small fish and also hold tons of insects, tadpoles, frogs, things like that that make great food for hungry predators. And many of these same animals use wetlands to hibernate during the winter. Of course, hundreds of thousands of migrating birds use our wetlands to rest and recover during their migration. But even if you're not a plant or animal lover per se, <laughs> you weren't sold on the importance of wetlands yet, think about this. Wetlands act like giant sponges on our landscape. During a storm or during spring snow melt, when all our yards are soggy and the gutters are full of water, wetlands help catch massive amounts of water, and they just hold that water. And the spongy soils and those thirsty wetland plants that I talked about soak up water much, much better than our, our yards or lawns and parks, paved areas, anything like that. And just like uh, if you soaked a sponge and set it on your kitchen sink, it would hold water, but it would eventually slowly let it out. And those wetlands do the same thing. When we are having a drought, not getting enough rain or snow melt, um, those wetlands that we're holding water slowly release it, and they actually keep our local streams flowing, keep our groundwater recharged during times of drought. Wetlands also act basically like a giant water filter, a natural filter. Of course, we've all seen how the lake and the rivers turn brown when we get heavy rains or snow melts. That's from all the clay washing off our landscape. Wetlands help trap those clay particles, and they also trap a lot of the pollutants that are hitching a ride on those waters. That's why some water treatment areas actually will plant wetlands to treat their water, just like they use other more technologically advanced methods. Wetlands can be very effective at doing that same job, and we're lucky enough to have lots of wetlands here in our city doing that for free. <laughs> so wetlands act like sponges, like water filters, but they're also important buffers. Now, if you think about Hurricane Katrina and um, the devastating impacts on the coastline there, where a lot of those wetlands that used to be there had been dredged or filled in, um, those areas were left exposed to the direct impacts from the ocean during the storm. And the same type of thing applies on our streams, or in the lakes and Lake Superior, but on a smaller scale. With our clay soils we have that are so prone to erosion, it's really important to maintain any natural buffers that we have, any wetlands that we have along our waterways. And finally, wetlands are just a great place to go explore and go enjoy and be outside. By canoe and waders, take a camera, go hunting or fishing there, harvest wild rice, cranberries, or just take a, a kid and go catch tadpoles and dragonflies with nets. So protecting wetlands means protecting the health and welfare of our residents, our businesses, visitors, and our environment. The state of Wisconsin has lost nearly half of its wetlands since the 1800s. The city of Superior is committed to managing our remaining wetlands responsibly and balancing that need with our need for economic development. So over the last 15 years, the city has been involved in several initiatives to reestablish and maintain that balance. I'm going to talk about a few of those initiatives, particularly the SAMP program, and I'll provide contact info for some other folks at the end to talk about, or who you can contact for other information about uh, the various other initiatives. 
I'm going to give quite a bit of detail about the SNAMP program because it's our primary program focused at wetland conservation and management in the city. Um, the Special Area Management Plan, they call, the SAMP we call it, is an innovative permitting program. It began in 1996 and it was really improved and expanded in 2007 in what we call the SAMP II. Um, now the first step in the development of the SAMP program involved a comprehensive inventory of the wetlands in the city. Over 5,500 acres of wetlands were surveyed in Superior for the SAMP II. That's that second round I mentioned in 2007. And those wetlands were all ranked as either high quality or low quality. And that was using a functional assessment, the same type of assessment that's done for um, any wetland permit through the DNR, the Corps of Engineers. So they were ranked then. And out of the 5,500 acres surveyed, about 1,100 were classified as relatively low quality. And that's because, um, well, for various reasons, but sometimes they were um, full of invasive species. Sometimes they would be right along highways, situations like that, if they were really impacted by some sort of development around them. Um, the high quality wetlands were set aside for protection or they would require an, a permit directly from the DNR and the core before any impacts could happen to those wetlands. But for those remaining 1,100 acres of low quality wetlands I mentioned, city residents and developers can get permits directly through the city get, and we call that a SAMP permit. And that would help them avoid the state and federal wetland permitting process, which can be costly, lengthy, and pretty complicated. Now with the SAMP permit, as I mentioned, applicants only need one approval from the city versus um, two from the core and the DNR. And also the, the, another benefit for people is that they have a staff person here at the city who is dedicated just to helping them through the permit process, and that's part of my job here at the city. And one of the biggest perks for getting a SAMP permit versus a standard wetland permit is a faster turnaround time. It's only 20 days to get approval on our permits. And the reason that we can do that is because city staff work with applicants to make sure they have all the information compiled before the application is submitted. And also because, as I mentioned, those wetlands have already been assessed and kind of pre-screened. And so we know that if they're applying for a SAMP permit, that they're already targeting one of those lower quality wetlands and it's not a high quality site. The other main benefit from the SAMP permit is that the mitigation is already taken care of. Mitigation, as you may know, is the process where wetlands that are filled in get replaced with wetlands that are restored or constructed somewhere else. This offsets the loss of wetlands that are impacted through permit ac permitted activities like home building or business development. Typically, permit applicants don't restore or construct wetlands themselves. They don't do the mitigation themselves. They pay someone else to handle that for them. And the city, in the case of the SAMP program, handles the mitigation. And as a benefit to permit applicants, to basically city residents and city developers, we charge about 25 to 30 percent of what it costs on the open market to do mitigation. We just charge enough to cover our costs. And that's a huge savings for permit applicants. So in summary, SAMP permits save people time and money over the standard wetland permitting process. Now this takes a huge investment on the part of the city to get this program going, to do that comprehensive inventory that I talked about, and to administer the program and manage that um, wetland mitigation component. But it really helps remove what would otherwise be a major obstacle to doing business in Superior. And that's that, that wetland permitting process that everyone will have to go through one way or another if they're going to develop that, those wetland properties that are currently undeveloped. Now on the flip side, we have a comprehensive inventory and assessment of nearly all the wetlands in Superior. And that's something that not many communities can say. And that means that when we make decisions about where to allow development in Superior, we're doing it in the context of a bigger landscape in full awareness of where the most important wetland resources are and ensuring that those areas have special protection. As I mentioned, this program is unique in Superior. There's only a handful of cities in the country with a SAMP program or something comparable, in large part because it is such a huge investment on the part of the city. But in cases where there are so many wetlands alongside active development, it's really a great strategy for a balanced approach. So that's a quick summary of a very complex program. <laughs> I'm going to move on and talk about some other initiatives, but feel free to ask questions at the end or contact me if you'd like more information about the SAMP program. The Lyman Lake Road Bear Creek wetland is actually where 
we handle the mitigation for the SAMP permits that I talked about. The site is about 20, 126 acres, um, and more than a half a mile of Bear Creek runs right through it. It's located just south of the city, and it drains into Yellowies Bay near Wisconsin Point. It used to be a hay field, as you can see in the photo on the left, and now it looks much different than that. Um, it'll eventually be home to over 80 acres of wetland. The city began restoring wetlands here four years ago to offset the loss of wetlands in the city resulting from development that were permitted through the SAM program. Before we can issue SAM permits, we have to prove to regulators, uh, the DNR, the Corps, the EPA, for example, that we've restored an equal quantity of wetland acreage here at this site. The site is open to the public, and if you were to visit, you would see a diverse mix of deep marsh, shallow marsh, sedge meadows, riparian stream habitat, upland habitat, a lot of those different types of wetlands that I showed pictures of before. And the site is pretty neat. It's teeming with wildlife year-round. Last year it was home to nine different types of butterflies, seven types of dragonflies, 25 bird species were seen, including seven that actually nested on site, and almost 150 plant species. The city is responsible for monitoring this site for the next six years. We've already done it for four, and that's to ensure the wetlands are successfully restored here on site. One of the less common ways that wet wetland mitigation is done is by preserving wetlands that are already on the landscape. And now this is not really one of the preferred ways of doing mitigation, and that's because there's actually a net loss of wetlands. If you permit impacts to a wetland and then offset that by preserving an existing wetland, you've actually kind of lost the wetland there. But in some cases, this is allowed, and that's when the wetlands being preserved are very high quality they're under threat of development, and it's a type of wetlands that we've already lost a lot of. And in this case, it's forested wetlands. In Wisconsin, we have lost a huge proportion of our forested wetlands that we used to have. So near the city's landfill out on Moccasin Lake Road, we've done this type of mitigation to offset impacts um, to wetlands around the landfill. Many acres shown here uh, within the yellow box are set aside for permanent protection and it's all in an area that's surrounded by other forested wetlands, has very few roads and trails, and is very close to Ellery's Bay and Lake Superior. So it's great habitat, and it's been permanently protected now. So those are just a few of the initiatives in the city to protect our wetlands. Um, the people listed here can provide information about other programs or regulations pertaining to wetlands. And lastly, before I wrap up, I just want to reiterate the importance of wetlands in Superior. They're important for wildlife and plants, but also for our homes, for our municipal infrastructure, and for water quality. If you or someone you know are thinking of doing any development, uh, building a home, putting in a driveway, anything like that, be sure to consult with a DNR or a professional or myself about whether there are wetlands first. Remember, it's not always easy to tell where there are wetlands. They're often dry at the surface for much of the year. And also that federal and state regulations require a permit for doing work in wetlands. So for more information, feel free to contact me at the number on the screen, or I can provide my email address as well. Um, and with that, I'll say thanks again for your interest, um, and that's all I have for the presentation today. Okay, thank you very much, Darian. And uh, I don't see any questions coming in. Um, so we, we're very glad that you were able to share what you're doing and with the City of Superior and for us to learn more about the City of Superior and its wetlands and the importance. Um, just for quick announcements of other things going on with Environmental Services Division here, Public Works uh, with the City of Superior, the, this webinar series will continue. It's going on two webinars a month. And we have the next one is September 10th, Organic Yard Care. Uh, and then September 24th is Climate Change with a speaker guest from Minnesota Sea Grant. So we hope you'll join us for those upcoming ones. And this has been archived. And if anyone wants to listen at a later date, this will be available. Thank you very much.